good morning, everybody. <laughs> Thank you very much for attending this presentation. Um, my name is Radu Koravu. I work for Syncosoft, the company which produces the Oxygen XML editor software solution. And uh, as we are a software manufacturer, we need a user's manual in order to explain to our end users how our product can be used. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to show you just about everything that we do internally in order to coordinate our development effort for Oxygen and the, our user's manual. And uh, this will also cover workflows and um, version control, how, how we collaborate with each other. And maybe at the end of the, this presentation, you'll get some ideas about how to do data on your side, or at least eliminate the notion that data is an expensive solution. We have two technical writers, we have a couple of contributors, occasional contributors, we have a couple of reviewers, so we tried not to, to have an expensive solution for, for producing our user manual using data. Uh, this is me. Uh, I have about 10 years of XML related experience. I, I'm not a technical writer, but occasionally I review technical documentation and occasionally I write small articles in order to to better show our users how, how a tool behaves. And these articles are, are sim sometimes merged back to the, to the main documentation. We have about three main very similar products, XML author, developer, and editor. These products have a lot of common functionality but they, they also have separate distinct features. So we want to have a lot of reuse in our user's manual because most of the content there gets published for both XML author, developer and editor. And for each of these products, uh, as a separate complication, we have two different distributions. We distribute a product either as a standalone application or as a plugin for the Eclipse Workbench. As a third complication <laughs> uh, for, uh, for the user's manual uh, setup, we have multiple platforms. So each product can run on multiple platforms like Windows, Mac, or Linux. So as we have a software product which runs offline, we also needed to think about having offline help for our users so that they could work without being connected to the internet, they could search for certain behaviors of the tool and have those results presented without an internet connection. So we have offline help. When our products run on Windows, we need to obtain Windows help for our user's manual. When our products run on Mac OS X, we need to obtain Java help. And when our products run on Eclipse, we need to produce Eclipse help from, from our user's manual initial content. And um, of course we have online help because most people Google information. <laughs> more and more often people don't, don't reach your support channels by, by writing you emails or by starting the application and going to the help link. They just Google for the information and expect to have the information searchable online. And of course, we also have our PDFs. Lately, I don't think we've, we have that, those, that many users using the PDF, but we mostly keep, keep it on our website for historical reasons, let's say that. We also have some special kind of help called dynamic help, which is a help window embedded in the application. And I will, I will show you how this works. And lately, 
we've been thinking about providing mobile-friendly documentation. So to provide web help for our cl clients, uh, web help accessible and looking great on, on mobile devices like iPhone on, on, uh, or iPads. So um, switching back to our application, I'm running on a Mac. When I go to help, this is the offline help available on, on the Mac platform. And uh, we also have this dynamic help view, which depending on the focus in the application, will show you the closest help topic available for you. So if I focus on the XPath bar, I get some help about using the Oxygen XPath toolbar. So <laughs> to, to do the math, we, we, need, we need it to extract from the same data content about uh, to publish and obtain three Windows help uh, compiled uh, formats, three Java help, uh, three Eclipse help formats, about six PDFs, six feedback enabled web, web help, and one mobile friendly web help that we use to test uh, if our clients are interested in, in this direction. So we have about 22 deliverables that we obtain from the same data content. And uh, most of our documentation is available online. So we, we have a page where we have links to our web help. So we have, for the standalone editor, we have web help, web help mobile, PDF. We have the Eclipse version of the standalone editor with the web help and PDF and so on for the XML author and, uh, and, for, and for the XML developer. And this is how our, our online web help looks like. It's like a three-pane uh, three help, like the table of contents on the left, uh, topics, the topic main content on the right, a search field so that users can search inside our help system to find various topics. And this is a feedback-enabled web help, meaning that at the end of each topic, users can uh, create an account, log in, and give us feedback about this particular topic. Maybe they didn't find what they were looking for, or maybe we need to rephrase certain aspects of our manual. So our users drive the change in our user's manual. We, before passing our user's manual to data about four years ago or five years ago, we used Dogbook for our documentation. Dogbook is also, also an XML format. We, keep, we kept a very large Dogbook XML document, which contained our entire user's manual with help translated bo both in French and English in the same XML document. Mm -hmm. And uh, we managed to obtain most of the output formats that I presented to you. So what is the reason for <laughs> us choosing DITA? Well, the main reason was that we wanted to improve DITA support in Oxygen XML Editor. So, so we wanted to eat our own dog food. So use Oxygen internally to develop our user's manual and obtain feedback both from external sources and from internal sources. We also had some problems with our dogbook manual. It, it was a monolith, a, large, a huge XML document uh, full of dogbook sections. It wasn't very easy to change the table of content structure when we wanted to reorder our content around. So we really wanted to give the modular approach a try. And our dogbook manual was mostly structured with the idea in mind that most of our users use the PDF version of the application. But at some point we realized that this PDF contains 1,400 pages, let's say. Nobody opens a PDF and then searches in it to, to get to a certain topic. People want the information available on the web. So we wanted to, 
to have our documentation designed to be more web-oriented. This means smaller modules in order for people to find specific tasks and specific topics to, to read. And of course, we always want an open standard. We wouldn't have gone for, for a closed standard which only a single product on the market could have been used to, to edit and publish. So we had a migration effort which took about four months. We had to remove the French translation from the dogbook document because it was lagging behind and we needed to simplify somehow this, um, this migration process. We used XSLT, a, a custom XSLT style sheet, to split the dogbook document and obtain a data map and topics. And this wasn't so much work but after we obtained the data map and topics, we realized that the topics are very large and we realized that we needed to learn modular writing. We need, uh, our technical writers had to go through each topic in order to adjust the topics and break topics into smaller modules. So <laughs> this is <laughs> the three months of work, so not the actual conversion for dogbook to data, but learning how to do data, uh, how to take those large sections and make them more concise and make them answer to specific user problems. Once we finished that, we had to work on the output formats. We used the data open toolkit and some of the output formats weren't properly obtained. Uh, because we, op we use an open source solution like uh, the data open toolkit for publishing, we contributed all our changes to the Data Open Toolkit project so that others can also benefit from this. And here's an overview of our current solution. We have, uh, have one single data map from which we, we obtain about six different outputs. Uh, we have multiple submaps, about 40 or 50 submaps, which group more than 1,400 1, topics. Because we want to obtain those different formats, we need to filter our data map based on, on what we want to obtain at a specific time. Uh, version management is done via a Git repository. So we choose a, an open source solution for ma version management. We use the Atlassian, com the commercial Atlassian Jira product for issue tracking. So we have issues which are passed through various stages um, we'll talk later about uh, our workflow. We use our own product, Oxygen XML Editor, for editing. We use the open source Data OT for publishing. And we managed to set up a continuous integration server, a Jenkins server. And the benefit of this is that once somebody makes changes to the user manuals and commit, the Jenkins server will start automatically in five minutes or 10 minutes and rebuild all the user's manuals so that the reviewers can either review in data content or they ju can just open the, the rebuild user manuals and, and look there for, um, for the changes. And we run a series on, of automated tests each night on that data map to check for various consistency problems. And I will talk, tell you more about those problems later. So we'll try to cover today versioning, how we set up our project, how we obtain our deliverables, reuse. We'll talk about a little bit about validation and error correction in our product, how we track issues, and how we review the documentation written by, by our colleagues. Initially, we kept our users manual in a subversion repository, but we recently moved to GitHub to host our users manual's data content. A GitHub, besides having public accounts, can also have private accounts. So we bought a private GitHub account, which we use either internally or externally with our occasional contributors. And also we use the source tree product it's a software application, it's a Git client, which you use to, to push changes to the, 
to the server and, and to, to obtain um, all, all the modifications from it. Whatever you're using, uh, we, ha we don't have experience with CMSs very much, with working with CMSs. Um, most CMSs, I think, uh, keep all the, all the data uh, remote and usually on a CMS you connect and lock a topic, edit it and then unlock it on the CMS. Um, most solutions like Git or Subversion uh, uh, allow you to clone the entire content on, on your local, local machine. So we are all working on our local machine on the topic and then we commit the changes back to the, um, to the remote repository. But whatever you are using, you should have versioning. You should be able to, to tag each release of your user's manual so that it matches each release of, our, uh, of the main product. So that every time you need to make changes to an older version of our user's manual, you can go to that branch in history, make changes and publish specifically on that branch and then push all the changes to your online web help so that people using all the versions of Oxygen like 15 or 16 will get a chance to, to use a corrected version of, of your user's manual. Of course, versioning also ensures the fact that you know who is to blame for certain changes. You can go back in time on, on certain topics and obtain uh, older content and so on. So we check out our project from the GitHub website. And uh, once we have the project locally, there's a project configuration file which comes with spell checking options, with profiling values, colors, and style, and, and different publishing customizations. So if we have somebody who checks out our project, and then loads in the oxygen in the oxygen project panel so this is a checkout of our project a local checkout our users guide and our users guide has a some point as userguide.xpr and i'm opening this as a project in oxygen and besides having links to to all topics if I go to the oxygen options, to the spell check page, I see that it has a small uppercase P here. This means that all this page uh, came with settings from the project. So once I load this project up, I can have the same setup that, that all my other colleagues are using. For example, the settings for this project have <coughs> spell check enabled by default and also in the dictionaries page we have a custom learned words folder with all the words that we consider to be correct and that we don't want the spell checker to constantly remind us that we, ha we made mistakes to, to certain words. So various pages are marked with this project sign and these, instead of being global options, all come fr from the project configuration file. So this is our private GitHub repository. Um, we have external contributors who to whom we, we might give for certain periods access to this repository so they can give us, for example, they can review our topics and give us feedback. And uh, we can use GitHub's mechanism of adding issues. So we, um, those contributors may add certain issues and say <coughs> you should change this topic and um, update this documentation. And we can, we can discuss on those issues and uh, they can issue pull requests on our project and so on. And this is the source tree client we are using. So it's a Git client which allows us to, to check out the entire repository from, from the GitHub website, work with it, and then push 
changes back to the website. As you see, we have marked all our releases, we have created branches for each one, so in this way we can go back and rewrite the documentation for a specific version and then push it to the, um, to the public repository. <laughs> As I told you, we reuse a lot of content uh, and I will tell you about um, how we apply our profiling filters, uh, how we reuse entire topics in our user's manual, how we define variables like the product name, which is a variable depending on whether I'm publishing the user manual for Oxygen XML editor or for XML author and so on, and how we reuse various small pieces of data content between, uh, between topics. So, because we wanted to obtain about six different output contents, we needed about six different profiling condition, set, condition sets to apply on, on that single data map. Author, developer, editor for the standalone version, and the author Eclipse plugin, developer Eclipse plugin, and editor Eclipse plugin. Let's try to look at some examples to show you how, how this works. Start with something smaller like... I have here a topic about oxygen installation options. And this topic at some point, I'll just increase the font size, has a sequence of installation choices. Not all these choices will be published for the XML author version. If I go to Oxygen and choose to see the profiling attributes, I see that all these choices are profiled to appear either in one or another publication. So this original choice will appear only in the XML author, but is will not appear in the Author Eclipse version of Oxygen. If you go to the text page, yes, this is XML. If you go to the text page, all these list items have the product attribute set on them with various values which define the publication in which the list item will be included. If for example, one of our technical writers makes mistakes and manually inserts something which doesn't exist. They will get an error. They will get an error because the Eclipse is not a, an allowed value for the product attribute. And these errors are reported beco because we use a, a subject scheme map which imposes restriction on, on the product attribute. So the subject scheme map says something like this. For the product attribute, I want to use only these values. Author, developer, editor, subversion client, and so on. For all other profiling attributes in DITA, I I want them to be prohibited. So once the technical writer makes a mistake and, for example, chooses to set the platform attribute on an element, he will get a validation error in the editor telling him that all values on the platform attribute are prohibited. And this subject scheme map is referenced in our main user's manual. So our main user's manuals has, has a, a topic reference to the subject scheme map, and this is enough for the editor to help you choose the right values for your product profiling and to signal validation errors. Uh, I will show you one more thing. If, as a technical writer, for example, I want to see 
which steps are applied for the XML author version. I can go here and choose to apply a profiling condition set. And once I do this, I will understand better that for the XML author, only these two choices are available and the other choices are, are faded out. They will be filtered in the published product when I'm publishing my XML author manual. All the choices that you see here, the profiling condition sets, have been defined at project level. So we all share the same profiling condition sets. And these condition sets actually refer to data filtering files locating on the user's manual local repository. Let me show you how, how a data val filter file looks like. So we have six filters for each of, of our uh, of the publication contents that we want to obtain. The filter for the XML author looks like this. So it excludes all other product values and only includes the author value in the final output. So basically, from the same data map, by using one of the six filters, we will obtain six different publications. And uh, I've already told you about how we control the values using the subject scheme map support. The subject scheme does more than controlling attribute values. Some people use it for taxonomies, but our main interest in it has been to, to prohibit users from making mistakes, from setting invalid values to certain profiling attributes, for pro prohibiting certain profiling attributes to be used uh, in the documentation. Again, you've seen how we can show the profiling attributes in the editor and see how each of the items, each of the data elements is profiled and is filtered from, from, the, from the output. Besides profiling inside the topic, we also have topics which are reused in multiple places in our data map. For example, I'm using an XML editor and uh, I have a tree of options. So this is our preferences, which has a tree of, of preference pages. For each of the, these pages, there is a, a corresponding page in our user's manual. So one data topic for each of the preference pages. And uh, to show you how the global preferences page is used. So this is the global preferences page, which ex explains the global settings in Oxygen. And as you can see, I have an indicator here showing me that it used four times in our user's manual. And I can navigate through each of these and see specific places in the data map where, where these global settings are used. So I can go through each of them and find all occurrences of this topic in the user's manual. If, let me try to focus a little. If I look here in our user's manual, we have a preferences submap and it is profiled for various, various version of, of the content we obtain. The most commonly used variable in our user's manual is uh, the product name. So, uh, of course, when you publish for XML author, you want the product name to be XML author and for the dev developer to be Oxygen XML developer. And uh, in order to, sorry, in order to 
reuse the product name. We have key definitions in our data map. So we have a key called product, which is expanded to Oxygen XML editor. And then in our data topic, we use a phrase which has a key reference to that product key. And uh, in the lower part, you can see how this looks like in the published output. So looking back, for example, at this topic, installation options, you see that it says installation options for Oxygen XML editor. And in the text page, this is done using the phrase keyref to product. If I change profiling condition sets here, I will get installation options for Oxygen XML author. So these profiling condition sets help me to see how the final output will look like, help me as a, a possible reviewer or, or technical writer. So while, once I'm changing this, I can see the product name change to reflect my choice. When I click on this, I go to the key definitions data map. So this data map defines the key product and binds it to, to Oxygen XML editor. It defines the key product quite a number of times, once for each product name that we need. And each definition of the product key is profiled. So the, the product key, the effective definition of the product key will be decided after the profiling is applied. So if I'm profiling based on the XML editor, the product key will be expanded to Oxygen XML editor. If I'm producing something for the XML author, the product key will be expanded to say Oxygen XML author. And uh, one more thing I wanted to show you. Um, as you use this Oxygen product variable in multiple places, uh, whenever we want to insert it, we can press Enter, choose product, and we have a special entry here. So once we insert it, we have Oxygen XML editor as the product inserted in place in, in, in that topic. So it's just a quick way of inserting the product name because we, we use it quite a lot. And uh, of course, we also have small pieces of data content like um, definition lists, steps, uh, entire paragraphs, notes that we reuse in various places in our maps. Uh, we are not using data content reference, we are using data content key reference. So besides having in a certain topic a reusable definition list, I can also, I also need to define a key for that specific topic and then I can make a content key reference to that key in the topic which wants to reuse that content. And, and that uh, the baseline is the output that I obtain from that specific fragment. And uh, just to show you something, we have a special a reusables folder in our data, ma uh, data project. So we just don't leave reusable content lying around in the project. We have a reusables folder and the reusables data map. And this data map is full of keys which define a reference to reusable content files. For example, this is a topic which contains three nodes. Each of the nodes is used in multiple places in our user's manual. And we wanted to have the reusable content separately because each time one of our technical writers edits content in this folder, he needs to take into account that this content is possibly used in multiple places. So he's not changing the content for only one context, 
but for all contexts in which the, the content is, is used. And for example, they can go to search references so that they can find all references to, to certain to certain notes. So this, this particular note is used in about nine places in the manual. So as I'm changing this note, I need to take care that my modification makes sense in all those nine places and not only in one of those nine places. Uh, of course, errors can always creep in and uh, uh, as the data map uses multiple topics, you may get a lot of broken links sometime. And we use uh, uh, the Oxygen XML validate and check for completeness action available on the data map toolbar. So each once we, we use that action on the data map, uh, each of the topic is validated according to the data standard, checks for broken links, key references, Maybe you have missing images or missing reference resources like links to PDFs. Maybe you have links to, to HTTP websites and at some point the link works, but after two version that website is down and you, you end up with broken links in, in your content and you have no knowledge of that. So running a divided entry for completeness, you can check for broken links to remote websites or maybe you're applying profiling on the data map and you end up with broken links in your internal documentation because certain topics are filtered out completely. So this validate and check for completeness also ensures this. And lately we added a tool called find and reference resources, which means that once uh, as your data user's manual grows, you may end up with topics and images which are no longer used and you don't, do not know where those are because you have 1,500 resources on disk. So find a reference resources is a tool which helps you find those topics and images and remove them from your project because they are obsolete, they are no longer used. We have a style guide, meaning that we have an internal way of passing knowledge about how our user's manual should be handled about uh, what we should do and what we should not do when writing content. So our style guide looks like this. Right now it's so it's just a data topic which explains maybe to beginner technical writers who, who want to 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 contribute to the Oxygen Style Guide, what to do's and not to do's when writing the documentation. Uh, as our style guide got larger, we realized that some of the rules in the style guide can be automated. So we developed schematron specific checks in our project to, to check various things that we wanted to prohibit uh, certain uses that we wanted to prohibit. And I will just show you a quick example for this. And so we have schematron checks, for example, we wanted to prohibit um, people to, to add a reference to an image and to set the scale attribute on it. We wanted images to be scaled before they are referenced. So this is the automatic validation which complains and says that dynamically scale images are not properly displayed, Pre please remove the scale, the scale attribute. So then I can go on and use a quick fix and which says delete the scale attribute and I get no more errors. So as we continue to, to grow our style guide, some of the style guide we managed to create schematron rules for it so that you do not need to read the entire style guide in order to, to work with the application. You have uh, automatic validation errors which, uh, which signal problems to you. And uh, we have a lot of schematron specific checks. I'm not sure if we have the time, but uh, we'll talk later on if, if we don't. And uh, you've seen the quick fixes. So besides telling people about the problem, we, 
we guide them to, to repair the problem. We also have project-wide tools which allow us to, to refactor the entire set of topics in the user's manual for, in order to, to remove a problem which may appear maybe in 500 topics. And uh, as we don't have much time, I will talk a, a, a little bit about e our issue tracking. We use the Jira, Atlassian Jira product, and we are very happy with it. Um, if you want an open source product for issue tracking, it's Bugzilla. If you want to, um, to have a, a, a cheaper alternative, a, a free alternative. And um, here is our entire workflow. Once one of our users um, has an improvement request, we create an issue for it. And this issue is analyzed and then confirmed by our, by our product managers. And then our developers take the issue to the result stage. Then our, our, after the code has been inspected by our code reviewers, and uh, after the quality assurance team has, has made sure that the improvement requested by the user was properly implemented in the application, the, the issue switches to the verified state. As the issue goes through each state, it, it signals these states as emails to the persons involved in the issue. So once I, I add an issue to the, to the list and the issue changes state, I get an email which tells me that the issue has, has been resolved, for example. So I can look into that and maybe see the changes. Once the issue is verified, the technical documentation team needs to either close the issue if it has no, no importance for, the, for our user's manual, maybe it's a small issue, or to make changes in our user's manual to adapt the manual so that it reflects the changes in the main product. And this also means sometimes making changes on our website in order to, uh, to adapt the, the what's new list on our website. Uh, on each Oxygen release, we have a list of what's new in Oxygen 17.1. So, so the technical writers, once they are at this stage, they can also um, adapt that list and, and enrich it. Uh, what, that, what we've seen happen, which is a good thing, is that the technical writers also get a chance to, to work with that issue because they need uh, to work with that feature because they need to document it. And it's, sometimes it happens that they find bugs that the quality assurance team hasn't found. So they become the second line of quality assurance in the company. They work with a finished feature because they need to document it. And once they do this, they discover hidden defects, so they can reopen the issue, and the, the original developer can, can reconsider his approach on that. And I sh I'll show you how Jira looks like. So this is an issue on Jira. It has a, a title. Um, it's been reported by someone, in this case me, it's assigned to someone, it has various fields, and it also has a note for documentation. Yes. So this is the note for documentation. And once this issue is fixed, in this case it was fixed by me, automatically the issue gets links to the, to the fixes that I contributed to the main project. And then the issue switches from various stages, from code reviewed to verified. And then Stephen, who works on the technical documentation side, will consider looking at the note for documentation that I've written before I've closed the issue, will consider whether to add information about the issue in the what's new section on our website or to add information about what I've done uh, uh, on the Git project. project. So one, this issue brings together all the changes that have been made in order to fix a particular user's problem. Once I have this issue, I can click 
these links and I can see changes which have been done, for example, on the GitHub project. And once I know the changes that have been done, I can review the changes. And I f if I do not agree with the technical documentation, I can reopen the issue for documentation. OK, <laughs> um, we also have some a simplified uh, workflow for reporting specific documentation issues, which is um, yeah works with the same principle that the issue has links to all the to all, all the changes which have been been made on the Git repository on the on the subversion repository. And here are what I've already presented you that the issue has links to the changes and to the website changes, and to the user manual changes. And once I want to review the changes, I can go and, and check out that particular topic, and I will use Oxygen ways of, of adding comments and uh, making changes to the document with change tracking enabled. And then I can re uh, reopen the issue, and the documentation team can see my, my proposed changes for, in order to fix it. As any as anything, <laughs> really, our user's manual continues to grow. Um, we keep producing new content for our internal style guide. We keep producing new schema tron rules to impose when editing it. At some point, we'll probably build a data specialization to, to restrict certain data elements. And at some point, we'll probably use relationship tables uh, for linking between topics instead of adding links to each topic um, for various related other topics. And uh, we might also consider using new DITA 1.3 features like key scoping and branch filtering. So it's a living thing which grows. It's not perfect, but it's perfectable. It's something which works every day and something which we use every day. And um, if you want some useful links, we have a link to our blog post, which uh, again shows you how, uh, some steps about uh, how we're developing our user's manual. We have a, a public version of our user's manual av available on GitHub if you want to download and try it. And um, if you want to know more about Schematron, there will be a later session about in the intelligent style guide uh, hosted by by George Bina, so you can also attend that if, if you're interested. Uh, that's about it. Uh, thanks a lot, and if you have questions, maybe one minute or two for questions. Um, yes? You referred to a data map yes. several times. What, what, what is a data map? Uh, a data map is like the table of contents of your publication. Uh, a data topic is a small, small module explaining only one concept, mm -hmm. and the data map assembles the modules in various ways, in various sequences. So I can go to the data map and reorder my modules around, and then I get a different publications. So it's a special kind of XML, which is an assembly uh, of the modules, let's say. Uh, other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, usually you want to, to technically enforce the validation. Um, also, if the authors choose to ignore the validation errors, we have automatic validation done on the server each night. So those validations are for them to easily detect and correct the problems. But each night they will get a report with all the problems. So uh, there is no way to, <laughs> to go around this. Uh, but of course, it's some, uh, something which is made with their help. So they are contributing those checks because they also want those checks to be applied. Um, anybody else? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. And um, <laughs> my, 
my colleagues from the technical documentation team, Bogdan and Steven are in the room. If you want to talk more about our solution, you can come back our to our stand and have a larger discussion about this. Thanks a lot. Have a nice day.